amongst the military. So it's that, that balance where we're depleting energy. So the way we, the metaphor that actually works really well, the way to think of resilience, is how much charge we have in an inner battery. Does that make sense? If you think of it, we wake up in the morning and we have a certain amount of energy, right? Literally, I mean physiologically, that's what cells do, they process energy. But in all those different domains I'm talking about. So it's becoming more aware and intelligent of how we renew and expend that energy is really the key to resilience. Okay, I'm, I'm doing what well, I'm usually doing four hours in a very short time here, but hopefully you get the concept. So, and I already said this, basically it's becoming more intelligent about our energy expenditure, how we manage it, how we renew it. So, talk a bit about the physiology. You guys probably all know the autonomic nervous system, is that true? Vaguely. Okay. So the autonomic nervous system, for those of you who don't, is what regulates over 95% of the internal body functions. You know, stuff we don't talk about. Again, it's very high up in the hierarchy of control of bodies, if you think physiologically. So we talk about the adrenaline rush, right? For example, it's the autonomic system that tells the adrenaline, the adrenal glands to secrete adrenaline. So they're pretty high up in the control. Sympathetic, and this is grossly oversimplified, is kind of like the accelerator pedal. You get more signals going down that branch. You're speeding, in general, speeding things up. It has a lot to do with hormonal system control. Parasympathetic system, on the other hand, tends to slow things down, like slows heart rate, for example. Has more, more interaction, more control over the immune system. Okay, very complex system. Both branches are always active, but they, are, they really are two different systems. Different neural pathways, different sources in the brain that they source from, and so on. For the, I'm a psychophysiologist, by the way, and labs for many, many years have looked at the autonomic system, the activity in the autonomic nervous system, as a measure of emotion, mental states, and so on. So it actually is true that every emotion we feel, whether we're conscious of it or not, you know, we associate not even know what's going on is reflected in a change in the activity of the nervous system. Okay? So that's kind of, again, why the emotional part is so important. We tend to think of the autonomic nervous system as the brain sending signals down to the body. It's only part of the story. You take the parasympathetic side especially. It's the primary nerves are the vagus nerves, two vagus nerves come down through the front of the body. They're very large nerves, thousands of fibers in each one. There's two of them on each side. That they kind of run along with the carotid arteries. 95% of those nerve fibers are what's called afferent or ascending. So only 5 to 10% of the nerve fibers are carrying information from the brain down to the body. So now we've been ignoring 90% of the nervous system for a long time. That's not new, I didn't invent that. That's been known since the late 1800s. You know, the neural anatomists had all this mapped out in the 1880s and so on. Just been ignored and forgotten because we got kind of brain focused. Right? It's all about the brain, right? I mean, the, the body's just there to carry the head around after all. Nobody believes that anymore. That was, not that long ago, that was the dominant paradigm, right? So, what we now know, it solved a lot of mysteries, so to speak, that were observed back starting in the 70s, is that within the heart itself, especially the human heart, there is a very complex, what's called a technical name, is the intrinsic cardiac nervous system, nicknamed the heart brain. And that's from a field, there's a whole field now called neurocardiology. That's not, some of you probably know this already. And there are neurocardiology centers all around the world. And there's a lot of important things that have come out of that, which I don't have time to go into. So, from that little brain in the heart, through all those, remember there's 90% of the nerves going this way? The vast majority of those actually come from the heart and cardiovascular system. So the heart is more interconnected with the brain than any other gland organ system in the body by far. Okay, there are other afferents from the gut and so on, but it's not even a close uh, comparison. So these signals that the heart's sending upstairs profoundly involve, or affect, influence brain function in very measurable ways. And this is uh, actually there's hundreds of papers on this. This is well-established, well-duplicated work. So, I'm from Missouri originally, that's where I was born, it's a show-me state. You know, I don't believe that people show me. 
So here's some photos, or microscopic photos, and, fo and focal microscopes, uh, pictures of the intrinsic cardiac nervous system in the human heart. So each one of these blobs here is what's called a ganglia. This level of magnification, you can just, the main point here is they're interconnected. Well, ganglia is just a group of neurons found outside of the brain. If the same clump of neurons are to blow up now, we're going into low-level magnification on a ganglia. Uh, this could be the interlaminar nuclei, it could be the central core of the amygdala, any of these brain centers. Same neurons, in fact, a lot of them are named after the neurons in the brain. Okay, they, uh, so each one of these round things is a neuron. So we have this distributed network of ganglia, and ganglia is meaning group of functional neurons outside the brain. Okay? They're all wired together. Now we get, oh, I didn't include that image. Okay, if we do a cross section, which I usually show, you can see all the interconnectivity. We now know that all the same, ex same experimental protocols have been done to show that these, a lot of these neurons have short term memory, long term memory, you know, all those kinds of things that you, neurons should do. Plasticity, all that same kind of stuff. Okay, this is the, the dots that show where the ganglia are located. That's the brain part, the distributed network. Then feeding into those, that the heart brain, are about 40,000 sensory neurons. They sense things. Pressure, rhythm, right? 80% of these neurons are sensing biochemistry. This is new. It's not necessarily new knowledge. But if you think about it, if you wanted to know what the biochemistry of the blood was, where would you put that sensory system? Heart. Makes perfect sense, doesn't it? So all that's processed within the heart brain. And you do have the what are called efront or descending neural stuff coming down from the, the brain. But the neuro, nervous system in the heart is pretty smart. <coughs> it can actually override and often does override the signals coming down from the brain. It has its own type of intelligence. It's a good thing. Actually, that's why we don't blow up. We get all pissed off and things. Finally, something has to finally come in and say, whoa, hold the phone here. You know, and override the, the, the stimulation from the efferents. So one of the ways we can measure this interaction between heart and brain and the dynamics going on in the autonomic nervous system. There's this thing called heart rate variability, which I suspect most of you know of. How many of you have M waves? A bunch of you, a third, okay. This is what it measures. So heart rate variability is a very different animal than heart rate. Heart rate's pretty simple, how many times the heart beat a minute. In a healthy person, in a resilient individual, our heart rate is changing with each and every heartbeat. It's doing that right now, sitting still, when you're asleep, and so on. So this is just kind of showing what we mean here. You measure the time between each and every heartbeat. So do the beats for an equivalent. So if all the beats were the same, that, that, the time between that beats is what, about seven, a little under 70, no, I'm sorry, 75 or so. Do the same for the next beat, right? Connect the dots, and that's what underlies or creates the heart rhythm. Make sense? You don't want variability. Okay. The amount of variability we have is very much related to our age. The older we get, the less of it we have. In fact, we can measure your variability and tell within about two years how old you are. So it's one of the best measures of biological age versus chronological age. Okay. If you are not well managed emotionally, and, you know, you're expending more energy than you're renewing, your variability will be lower than it should be for your age. That's important because in cardiology, it is a stronger predictor of future risk of serious, in fact, it's correlated with all cause mortality and uh, health, health outcomes than what your blood pressure is, whether you smoke or not, what your cholesterol level is, and so on. So, in the, in the cardiology field, it's most HRV is mostly used as a risk assessment tool. Okay, there's a whole other silos in medicine. Uh, so it, it's on the psychophysiology side, it's used as a measure of resilience. So the more variability you have, the more psychological flexibility you have. In fact, if you take two people the same age, hook them up, measure their variability, if one, the one that has, it has more variability than the other tends to do, in a significant way, better on cognitive function tasks. Okay? So this isn't just, there's a lot of research outside of our lab, so I'll show this now. <clears throat> so there's a causal relationship between what the heart's doing and cognitive function. It's interesting that the cognitive functions that are most 
correlated with HRV are the ones that require an exec the executive functions, the frontal lobes. You have to think about something, make a good choice, make a decision. Not so much the muscle memory kind of stuff. So this is now, uh, back here we were looking at a few seconds, 20 some seconds. Here we're looking at a few minutes. This is actually, this is HRV data. These two graphs are in the same person. Fairly close to each other. So up here is what we call an incoherent rhythm. Pretty chaotic looking, right? I mean, it's not extreme, it can get way worse. So what do we do to this person to make it look like that? Stress? Stress? Close. Panic. Sorry? Panic. Panic? Nope. Restrained. Not restrained. No, actually standing still. It's arrested. There's no physical movement here, by the way. Startled? Startled, no. Okay. Kind of pissed off. Kind of frustrated. This is frustration. Actual real anger is way worse. Much more chaotic looking. Okay. So one of our kind of one of the things that we got known for back in the very early 90s was demonstrating that our emotional state is reflected in the pattern of the heart rhythm. In fact, one of my colleagues is taking some of our early work to the next step now and showing that with just, just a single measure, HRV, you got you can with the current you're using your own nets and stuff, they got 75% accuracy of discrete emotional state detection. Okay? In other words, you can discriminate anger from, you know, anxiety and so on. You know, we're feeling good. So more importantly, though, that chaotic-looking pattern is reflecting something very deep and fundamental in our physiology. And that is that the activity between those two branches of the nervous system, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, are out of sync. Make sense? Good analogy for it, it's like driving your car, one foot on the accelerator, and the foot on the brake. You know, you're riding the brake, right? A lot of you might not be old enough to have taught kids how to drive yet, but that's a, <laughs> I've gone through that. That's the main thing, is they just can't help it. Why is that not a good idea? Why do you not want to drive your car that way? Okay, participation now. When you wear out the brakes, drive train, sure, more stress, right? What else though? Excellence. Well, yes, probably a jerky ride. Fighting. Fighting? Inefficient. Inefficient. What about your gas mileage? You burn out a lot more energy than you need to? That's why it's such a good analogy for this. We are major drain going on. Energy drain. Right down to the biological, biochemical level. Okay, these, right? All these nerves going up to the brain. This is the signal hitting the brain. I'll talk about that more in a second. But basically that inhibits brain function. Same person, moments later, in a very different rhythm. This is what we call a coherent rhythm. So the amount of variability, this is somebody in their 30s, by the way. So they're on average going from about peak to trough, about 20 beats per minute. So you got a 20 beats per minute range. So somebody in their 70s would be about half that, about 10 beats per minute. That's that age effect. But that's not the important part here. The amount of variability, which is what reflects our resilience, is the same in both graphs. So what's reflected in the pattern is current state. And in the bottom rhythm, that coherent state, the activity between the two branches of the nervous system is synchronized. The nervous system's in sync. So remember, there's probably 20 heartbeats that go on just to create one cycle here. So we've got lots of variability, but it's organized. It's ordered over time. Make sense? So it's reflecting a deeper autonomic coherence well, within not just the nervous system but brain function as well. Yes? I presume it's inferred to be between brain function. You've measured it up in the it's, actually been, it's actually been demonstrated. Guy Julian Kin did a lot of work on this showing, yeah, the neural stuff here reflects this. There's a strong correlation. <clears throat> but it, uh, as important as all this afferent stuff. That's why I'll keep hammering that. It's not just brain down. The stuff coming up is just as important to create these two patterns as what's going down. I could go out and that, we just don't have time for today. The reason that's important, so I talked about it, especially you, on the sympathetic side, 20% of all the neural pathways are after or ascending. On the parasympathetic vagal side, 90-95%. So those neural pathways coming up, they synapse into the brain system, the brain stem, sorry. There's a number of very strong neural pathways, I don't, I'm not going to go into all that today, but to show you the diagrams of it, that go directly, one synapse away, as I like to say, one of those is to the thalamus, 